All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second session, The Truth About Drinking Water. We're so excited to have you all this week. Today, you'll hear from guest speakers from CMAP and the Metropolitan Planning Council on topics related to water affordability and water resource management. But before we get started, I am going to pass it over to my colleague, Courtney, who will announce this week's prize winner. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the floor of session two. Um, as you all know, we've started doing a gift card uh, for our most engaged student on our Flip Engagement page. So this week's winner is, drum roll please, Fatima Vasquez. Congratulations, Fatima. Um, Fatima was super, super engaged this week. Um, not only did she participate in each of the activities on the FLIP engagement page, but Fatima, you also commented on other students' posts, you engaged with other students, um, and that's what we really want to see. So congratulations again. Uh, you all do have the opportunity to earn in the next week, week three, and also week four. So um, head on over to the FLIP engagement page. Um, also make sure you change your name under profile so that you can get credited for uh, your participation. We don't recognize certain um, profile names and numbers that we see. So please make sure you go ahead and change your name so we can um, give you credit for that. Um, and then also be sure to pay close attention to um, our session leaders and um, our guest speakers today. You'll have another chance to earn a gift card. So now I'm going to pass it over to Maggie Jar and Katie Piotrowska. Thanks, Courtney and Michelle. Um, again, welcome everyone to session two of our FLIP program. Uh, we're really excited to be speaking to you today about drinking water. Um, some of our learning objectives for today will be to learn about sources of drinking water in Northeastern Illinois, um, discuss how planning impacts uh, water quality, quantity, and cost, and participate in an interactive activity that focuses on water affordability and equity. Before we get into our presentation, we'd like to ask you all a question. And the question is, what county are you from? And we'll give you a few moments to um, go ahead and answer that question. All right, so it looks like the majority of you, 81% are coming from Cook County. Uh, we have a smaller percentage coming from DuPage, uh, Will, Lake, Kane, McHenry, and no one from Kendall. So depending on where you live, um, your drinking water sources will be different. Um, so where does our drinking water come from? In Northeastern Illinois, the main sources of drinking water include Lake Michigan, groundwater aquifers, as well as the Fox and Kankakee rivers. Um, in this map, you can see the distribution of all those different drinking water sources. So for those of you living in Cook County, um, in the city of Chicago, um, in the blue areas on the map, your, lake source, your water source would be Lake Michigan. Um, uh, Kane, uh, Kendall, and Will counties on the outskirts of the region rely on groundwater for their drinking water supply. And this would include um, shallow groundwater aquifers that are depicted in this tan color on the map, as well as uh, deep sandstone aquifers, which are depicted in the darker brown. Um, a small number of communities, including Elgin, Aurora, and Willington, uh, rely on the Fox and Kankakee rivers for their water source, and they're depicted in green on the map. 
Um, so all of these water sources are essential for sustaining economic development, um, as well as environmental and public health in our region. Uh, it's also important to note that each of these drinking water sources has some limitations and challenges, which we will cover later in the presentation. Um, but it's also important to note that how we manage our drinking water sources and how we maintain our drinking water infrastructure will determine the quality, quantity, and cost of water supply in our region in the future. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Maggie, who will discuss drinking water infrastructure and regulation. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, so having the supply is one thing, uh, but a lot of effort and resources are needed to clean, store, and deliver that water to your tap. Uh, and drinking water infrastructure is comprised of many physical components, which include wells or intake pipes that collect water, treatment plants that acquire and purify that water, water mains, pumps, and pipes that transport water, and of course the towers and reservoirs that store it uh, and pressurize it for us. So next we've got a diagram here to help tie that all together. Um, so first at the top you can see um, that water needs to of course be collected at the source. So surface water like Lake Michigan is obtained through an intake pipe and groundwater is pumped using wells. Uh, this source water is then piped to a facility where it can be filtered and treated so that it is safe to drink. Um, and then once it's clean, that water leaves the treatment plant uh, and must be safely stored until it's needed. And so I'm sure many of you have seen water towers in and around your communities. Uh, and those towers are really important facilities to help ensure that there's enough storage capacity to meet all of our expected and unexpected needs. And finally, when it is needed, clean water is pumped to our homes, our schools, our businesses through a complex network of underground pipes. Uh, it's a pipe network that contains valves throughout the system to control location, pressure, and water flow. And in this diagram, you see in blue uh, our water main, which is the primary pipe that brings water to your home. Uh, and then represented in green, you see the service line, and that is the connection uh, between your community's water source uh, and your home. And we'll be hearing more later about how these uh, infrastructure um, components and materials deteriorate over time and the importance of replacing old pipes uh, to avoid any water main breaks, leaks, and corrosion. So now I'm guessing many of you uh, on the session today are familiar with Chicago's most visited tourist attraction, Navy Pier, which you can see uh, pictured here along Lake Michigan shoreline. Uh, what you might not know is that just north of Navy Pier is the largest water treatment plant in the world, the James W. Jardine Water Purification Plant. Uh, and together with the Eugene Sawyer plant on the city's south side, Chicago can process almost 1 billion gallons of water a day for our region. So pretty significant. Similar to electricity and gas, water is a utility consumed by the public. Uh, it's seen as an essential service and it is subject to regulation. So whether you're connected to a public water system or a private well, all water systems uh, in the United States must comply with state and federal regulations to ensure that safe drinkable water is delivered to the public. The United States Environmental Protection Agency is the ultimate regulator of our safe drinking water. Uh, and our state uh, EPA, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, is the state agency that's charged with enforcing those safe drinking water standards. Now, as you can imagine, there are costs associated with monitoring water quality, treating that water, uh, and maintaining that infrastructure. So when you or your parents or your landlord receive your water bill, uh, you're not just being charged for the amount of water that you've used, but you're also helping to cover those base costs of providing water, the electricity that's needed to transport and clean your water, uh, and the personnel and other costs of daily maintenance of that water delivery system. And so now that's a very brief introduction to drinking water concepts from myself and from Katie. Um, before I turn it over to Nora, who's going to talk more about how planning influences water quality, quantity, and affordability, uh, we have another polling question for you all. 
question is, if you had a limited supply of water, what would be your top priority uh, for using it? Um, so we know that this is a finite resource uh, and please choose up to three responses here um, for how you would like to use water. And we've got many, many different categories. I see the responses coming in now. All right, lots of activity on this one. Okay, just a few more moments to get your responses in. Great, well, it looks like the top choice, 100% uh, of folks indicated human consumption, so drinking water uh, is a critical use. 75% of you all indicated um, ecological value, so preservation, wildlife habitat, uh, and other related uses um, is critical as well. And then let's see, the next one here in third place with 58% uh, of the vote is irrigation, so lawn watering, crops, uh, and other related uses. Great, and then just behind that, um, just to make sure we've covered it all, let's see, the next one, we had transportation, uh, followed by manufacturing and industry, recreation, uh, including fishing and boating. And then lastly, it looked like just 2% of folks indicated urban development. So that would be swimming pools, golf courses, uh, and other similar uses. Great. Thank you all for participating in that poll. Um, and we're just about ready to hand off the presentation to Nora Beck. Uh, as a senior planner at CMAP, Nora has helped to shape a uh, regional vision for water resources in the uh, current comprehensive plan for our region on to 2050. She has led the agency's investigation of regional water issues through the development of the Regional Flood Susceptibility Index and on to 2050 Regional Water Demand Forecast. Nora manages a variety of projects that incorporate sustainability, stormwater management, and water supply planning in local plans. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and master's degree uh, in urban planning from the University of Michigan. So with that, thank you, Nora, for joining us this afternoon. And I just wanna remind our students to please add your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we will have some time towards the end of the hour uh, for Q&A. Great, thanks Maggie. Uh, as Katie talked about, our water supplies support the region's industry, our households, and our energy generation needs. In fact, water is the reason that Chicago is located where it is. Uh, throughout uh, human history, people have formed settlements near the sources of drinking water, as well as to use those lakes and rivers and oceans as a means of transportation. So our access to Lake Michigan uh, truly made the city of Chicago and the, and the Chicago region what it is today. Our drinking water is typically managed by a municipal water department, which we commonly refer to as a water utility. Engineering and technical experts make decisions about the day-to-day -day operations of a water utility. And urban planners are typically not involved in that, in that operational process. But the, but the decisions that planners are involved in involved with impact that larger context in which the water utility operates. During today's presentation, I'm hoping to leave you with a sense of how planning impacts the quality of our drinking water sources, how it also plays a role in how much water we use, and in turn, how much water supply is available, and then how it influences the cost of providing water to our homes and businesses. And that's basically going to be our agenda. I'm going to step through each one of these three topic areas and provide you with some context about planning's role in the issue and then cite a specific example in our region. So next slide. Um, yeah, so we're just going to get a better sense of how planning impacts the quality of our drinking water sources. Next slide. You might already be familiar with the water cycle, but just a quick review. Uh, precipitation, as shown in the, in the diagram on the top right, comes down in the form of rain or snow, and it falls on our landscape. And some of it infiltrates into the ground, as shown on the right-hand side of this diagram. That water can eventually flow deep into the ground and get stored in areas where the rocks have a bunch of crevices or spaces between them. 
And we typically refer to these areas as aquifers and the water that's stored within them as groundwater. Rainfall can also just flow directly into our wetlands, our streams, and our lakes. And in both of these scenarios, the water is typically cleaned along the way, where any sediments or particles in the water settles into the earth, and we've got clean water flowing into our waterways. Next slide. Um, but however, when we, when we develop the land, we, are, we begin to introduce ways for pollutants to get into the water cycle. So in this diagram at the top, we, we know that industrial businesses can pollute into our waterways and into our groundwater. Now many of these chemicals might be, might be regulated by the federal government, but accidents still occur. In addition, we're always developing new chemicals, um, and some of the effects of these chemicals or their interaction with one, one another is not commonly known in advance of their release into the environment. We also know that air pollution from our cars and from our coal and natural gas power plants enter the water cycle as well. And then stormwater runoff uh, picks up anything on the surface of our lawns. So that could be the fertilizers or pesticides that are applied, or it picks up uh, pollutants on our streets. So that could be oil residue or dust or other items. All these pollutants get swept away and when it ra rains, it enters into the, into the water cycle. Next slide. So this map illustrates just one way that we can detect the impact of development on the health of our water uh, systems. Researchers have gone out and assessed the quality of our streams in the region, looking for characteristics that make a stream good for aquatic life. And you can see that all the streams they've identified as high quality on this map because they're highlighted in those thicker colors of orange and teal. The gray color in this map is showing the location of urban development. And you can see the streams located in these areas are not highlighted as high quality. The high quality streams are generally located at the edge of the region where development hasn't happened yet. And that's largely the result of stormwater runoff where, where rain is picking up those pollutants on our asphalt and concrete um, instead, of, instead of having a, a slow filtration into the ground. Next slide. So what does this have to do with, with urban planning? Ideally, we wouldn't be producing chemicals that cause us and the environment harm. So limiting their introduction into the environment is, is definitely the most direct way to reduce this pollution. But planning plays a role as it dictates where and how development is happening, which in turn impacts how much stormwater is created and where it's flowing. And so these are a couple of different ways that, that impact our, uh, the quality of our water supplies, the location of development and the form of development. And I'll step through these. Natural areas in the region, like, like this shown in the picture, um, provide amazing water quality surfaces. They, they help filter and clean the water and they infiltrate it into our groundwater aquifers. But development of these areas can mean that those services are no longer provided. So right from the get-go, that's one way that the location of development impacts our water quality. In addition, if this area was developed, it would probably include some streets and some sidewalks and driveways and parking lots, some rooftops. And so all of those are impervious surfaces where rainwater will, will carry pollutants like road salts and fertilizers into our streams and our groundwater. Planners uh, play a role in trying to avoid development in sensitive areas, protecting those natural areas, and accommodating that population growth through using infill and redevelopment. These are all really important strategies for maintaining our water quality. Next slide. On a related front, even if a natural area does get developed, the form of that development can also play a role in the quality of the water. So on the left, we've got a lot here that it's a conventional subdivision where the whole area is divided into individual residential lots. They're probably of equal size. And on the right, it's a, it's a different version of this. So the new lots are clustered to allow for natural areas to be retained. So each lot is, might be a little bit smaller, but then all of these lots have access to these common lands that are also providing those, those environmental services. Next slide. And this concept doesn't just apply to new areas at the edge of the region. So planning and development standards also set the guidelines for landscaping. And they can encourage practices that help clean our stormwater runoff. So instead of a typical yard with a, lo a lot of turf grass, this property has tons of native or other deep-rooted plants that are capturing and filtering that rainwater and improving our water quality in the process. 
So with that, I wanted to provide an example of, of a specific uh, situation that's happening in the region. Um, and it's been hot recently, <laughs> um, but you remember back when it was freezing and you'd walk down the sidewalk um, uh, or in a parking lot and you'd hear that crunch of the salt under your feet. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, these are all examples of where we use road salts. Uh, we use road salt to melt that ice that forms on our freeways, our streets, our parking lots, driveways, and sidewalks. And we generally apply way too much salt onto, onto these surfaces. Next slide. The impacts of this are pretty significant. Uh, so in this map, it's, it's showing Kane County over three different time periods. Uh, and, and they're measuring the content of chloride in each of these wells. And so uh, chloride is what road salt is composed of. On the map on the left, it shows uh, Kane County in the 1940s and 1950s. So at that time, there wasn't a lot of development or, or roads in the county. And the level of chloride in the wells was relatively low. But over time, shown in the 1980s in the middle or in the early 2000s in the, in the map on the right, the amount of chloride is generally, has generally been increasing as we expand out into the county. Now, the chloride levels in the water supply are higher than the, the drinking water standard that's set by the federal government. Now, who cares? We eat salt all the time, right? <laughs> uh, well, chloride is very hard to remove in a treatment process, and as a re result, the water can taste pretty salty if the levels get too high. In addition, a lot of people are trying to cut down on, salt, on their salt intake for health reasons, and so having chloride already in the water can make that very difficult. Uh, next slide. So what can we do to protect our water quality while also maintaining safe sidewalks, parking lots, and streets? Well, first and foremost, we can use less salt, and this is something that we can all start doing immediately. Um, when you're walking down a sidewalk and you hear that crunch crunch of salt under, you, under your boots, you know that way too much salt has been applied. Uh, shoveling first is definitely the most effective way to reduce ice, and it's also a neighborly thing to do. Um, and when you do use salt, you can carefully apply it. So apparently a 12 ounce coffee mug uh, should be enough to salt 10 sidewalk squares. So think about that ratio and, and what you saw last winter and, and whether or not we were hitting that mark. At a municipal level, more and more villages are moving over to different salting uh, techniques for roadways, which is really important and it also cuts down on cost. Um, but how can planners specifically help with this issue? So planners set the standards for street widths and the size of our parking lots through parking requirements. So basically, we are determining the amount of concrete and asphalt that will be created that will eventually need to be treated with salt in the winter. So thinking carefully about those requirements and limiting it to what is actually necessary is super important. And when we do um, decide to build a street or a parking lot, we can design it differently to handle that stormwater in a different way. There's growing evidence that, that streets that are composed of porous pavement, or pavers that where the water is allowed to infiltrate into the ground, generate less ice because there's less water standing on the surface of that pavement. So there would be less need to apply salt to begin with. All right, so that was the first topic area. Let's switch gears and talk about how uh, planning affects how much water we use. Uh, the next slide uh, shows all the different types of uses or the different ways that we use water in the region. Uh, so we clearly use water in our homes and that's what we call the residential sector. We also use water in industries and for power generation. Uh, the water use varies by the type of industry. So large amounts of water are used mostly to produce food, paper, and chemicals. Agriculture and irrigation is another category, and golf courses fit in here if they are watering, um, watering or irrigating their land to keep the grass looking green. And then last but not least, we've got our commercial and institutional uses. So think about the car washes and the restaurants, or maybe the community pool or the splash pad in your neighborhood park. Uh, the main factors of how much water we use depend on how many people are in those areas and, how, and what types of jobs uh, they are working on. In the next slide, um, this, this probably looks familiar. Katie went over our different water sources at the beginning of the presentation. But just a reminder, we've got the access to Lake Michigan water. We've got groundwater shaded shades of brown and then river water in green. 
I bet that because most of you live in Cook County, you're probably drinking Lake Michigan water. And Lake Michigan serves about 80% of the region's population with drinking water. But each of these sources have their limits. So um, this, it's not an infinite amount of water that we have for drinking water. We have to live within, within um, basically different water budgets. I'm going to step through each, each one of these. Um, so in the early days of Chicago's history, the Chicago and Calumet Rivers used to flow into Lake Michigan. And you can see that in the diagram on the, on the left. We also used to dump our wastewater and raw sewage into those rivers, which would flow into the lake. Uh, and as the lake was also our water supply, uh, this was pretty problematic, right? We had a lot of health problems in the early um, uh, days of, of Chicago's development. So civic leaders at the time decided that we needed to reverse the rivers so that they would no longer flow to Lake Michigan. And instead, they would flow into the Illinois River, which flows into the Mississippi River, which eventually flows into the Gulf of Mexico. And that means that our wastewater would flow that direction while we could still draw clean drinking water from Lake Michigan. Uh, in the next slide, you can see that relationship in the diagram on the left. <clears throat> So our neighboring states didn't like this very much. Uh, they got very concerned about the impacts of our diversion of that water on the health of the overall Great Lakes watershed. And they filed a lawsuit that eventually made its way to the US Supreme Court. Uh, and the court agreed with their concerns. And in 1967, the court um, ruled that Illinois could maintain our diversion, but that we had to live within a budget. So we cannot take out more than 3,200 cubic feet of water per second from the lake. Now that's a really bizarre measurement. Um, it probably was reflecting what was happening at the time, but it's roughly equivalent to 2.1 billion gallons of water per day. Uh, about half of the amount that we actually take out is used for public drinking water supplies. Uh, so that's, that's all that water that Maggie was talking about uh, that that Jardine treatment plant takes out. The balance of the diversion is allocated to stormwater runoff, uh, lockage and leakage, and, and all these navigational issues that are involved with managing the, the Chicago and the Calumet River system. So again, this is our water budget, and we need to stay within that amount. Now that amount is a lot of water, um, but it's already serving 80% of our region. Uh, so we need to use that, that water wisely. All right, the next example of the groundwater. <clears throat> so while Lake Michigan is subject to legal or those are management constraints, the supply of groundwater is really subject to geological or physical constraints. Um, and, and those constraints really depend on the characteristics of the aquifer that you're depending on. In this diagram, we see the surface of the land on top, and then we see all the layers below the surface. In that first blue layer, we see an unconfined aquifer. Uh, that just means that the water is very connected to the rainfall that's happening at the surface of the land. So rain today could easily filter down in a matter of days or years into this aquifer, and that's pretty quick in geological terms. Um, and, then, and then that water could flow into our well or they could flow into a nearby streams. So these aquifers are, are quickly replenished as long as it keeps raining. Um, and as long as the rate that we're withdrawing water is, is less than the amount of rain that we're getting. So during periods of drought, which we could, we could foresee happening more frequently with climate change, this dynamic could change, right? There, there, isn't that, there won't be that rain to replenish that shallow aquifer, but we'd still be wanting to use the water. And so we could be, we could be resulting in some water shortages in that unconfined aquifer. However, um, the deeper we go, the longer it takes for that water to travel to these confined aquifers. And you can see those, those bands um, below the unconfined, so the last two blue bands in this diagram. Water that is stored in these locations may have been in, been in the form of rainfall centuries or millennia ago. So they've taken a long time to get to these spots. So these aquifers are way less susceptible to drought because they're, they're not as influenced um, um, by, by the um, by the rain that's falling today, but they can be overused if we're using them faster than, than that slow recharge rate that they have. 
And then last but not least, in the next slide, we'll uh, see our river water constraints. So aquatic plants and animals depend on specific conditions in a river to survive. And one of them is simply having enough water in the river, right? There's got to be enough space to swim. As water levels go down, the water is generally warming up. And that also changes the chemical composition of the water itself, and it can make it inhabitable for aquatic life. Water levels go down due to weather conditions and drought, but they could also go down because humans are pulling too much water out of the river. So the state regulates the amount of water we could take out. It basically sets a threshold so that all the different users do not withdraw water to a point where it reaches a low condition. All right, so those were the water constraints. How does planning impact the amount of water we use and whether we are living within the limitations of any one of our drinking water sources. So planning impacts the number of people and jobs located in a given area. So that in turn impacts how much water is being used and what source it's depending on. Uh, and also the form of that development and what land uses are being done there um, can also impact the amount of water we use. So I'm gonna step through each one of these. Um, <clears throat> So the CMAP pays attention to, to the distribution of where people and jobs are located in the region. And we also provide estimates of where we think they could be located in the future. We also use those estimates to understand how much water we're gonna need in the future and what sources it's, um, it will, could it be provided from. Um, and this is known as our regional water demand forecast. The last time we did this, we projected out to the year 2050. And this chart, is showing the, the projected change in water demand by water source from 2011 to 2050. And so you can see in the, there's the zero line in this chart is, is smack dab in the middle. Um, so anything in light blue means that the demand is increasing and anything in dark blue means the demand is declining. So we see that shallow groundwater dependent communities and sandstone aquifer dependent communities, those are the deeper aquifers, um, are projected to increase around 30%. And we're also projecting a decline of Lake Michigan withdrawals by 9% by the year 2050. And so when you think back to those different constraints on our available supply, you can instantly see how planning decisions play a big role in, in what sources are being used in the region. Let's go to the next slide. So we also know that certain land uses or building types or development patterns consume more water than others. And so planning decisions play a big role here as well. In Northeastern Illinois, water use tends to be lower in communities with more compact development. Uh, and that's really related to how much yard space you have and if you're watering your lawn. Um, outdoor lawn watering can make a big uh, component of an individual's water use. Compact development, as well as water efficient plumbing, building, and landscaping standards can make it easier for residents to reduce water use without even thinking about it. So let's step through an example in our region. <clears throat> our sandstone aquifers are those deep aquifers where it takes a water a long time to replenish. Um, and as a region, we've been withdrawing water from these aquifers for a while now. And the amount that we've taken out has, has um, been, we've done it faster than the amount of water that's going in, which means we've been slowly using more of that water that's stored in the aquifer. And as a result, water levels in these aquifers are declining and some wells are no longer able to supply water. Uh, the next slide shows a diagram of this issue. So this diagram is like a, a slice of layered cake. On the top, you see the surface of the land, and Lake Michigan is blue in the, in the far back of the image. The city of Chicago is labeled there, <clears throat> and you can also see a few other towns like Joliet and Aurora and uh, Shorewood and Yorkville. On the sides of this diagram, you see those layers of the cake, and those are really the layers of the aquifer. The gray parts are those confining layers where water is not stored. And then there's the space between those, and that's the aquifer. That's where the water is stored between the gaps and crevices in the rock. And as I was saying, the water levels in, this, in these aquifers have been dropping. And you can see the locations highlighted in red and orange of where this is happening. 
uh, where the dark red color indicates that we've, we've taken out all that stored water that was, has been stored there over the, over the centuries. And these areas are predominantly located in Will County and in Kendall County. And they're impacting wells in Joliet, Shorewood, and Yorkville, among others. So the next slide sort of explains how we got there. Uh, communities and private industries in the area have been pulling more water than what, what we call a sustainable yield. The sustainable amount would be the amount that could be withdrawn without leading to a further decline in the supply. And so while the sustainable yield in, in this specific area of Will County is around two and a half million gallons of water a day, but our, our industries and our communities have been pumping out approximately 30.5 million gallons of water a day from the aquifers. So this is a pretty big disconnect. Um, and they can still do that because there's so much water stored there, but now they're hitting, that, they're hitting the bottom of that supply. In the next slide, <coughs> We know that this, this overuse has been happening for decades, where the water stored in the aquifer has been depleted and has caused those water levels to drop. This map just focuses in on Will and Kendall counties, um, and it sh shows, oh, some arrows. <laughs> um, it shows various conditions at, at, at different time periods. So in the first map, you see the conditions right now in 2020. Uh, where sandstone wells in the orange locations uh, may already be in encountering problems producing water. They might produce, they might still produce water, but maybe not at the same rate that they used to. The next map projects out into the future. Here again, where planners are trying to estimate how much demand could, could happen in the year 2029. Um, and, and here we're showing that that issue will, will uh, likely get worse, where those sandstone wells in, the, in those red locations will begin to run dry or pump sand. So this is basically under the city of Joliet. And, in, and Joliet has decided to switch off of the groundwater because of these issues, and they're gonna use Lake Michigan water instead. And their goal is to make that switch by the year 2030. Uh, so this, will generally help the aquifer system a bit, um, but as we continue to pro project uh, into the future by the year 2050, as shown in the map on the right, that risk of, of, um, of a lack of supply remains, and we have new high red, red zone risk locations that pop up further south. So what can we do to maintain our water supply? Um, as planners, we are making long-term decisions, right? And we want to, our neighborhoods and towns to thrive for years to come. Uh, for them to do that, we need them to have water. And so the best way to have water in the future is to use less water now. Um, and there are a variety of different planning strategies uh, where we can use less water. We can use compact development, as I was talking about before. We can reduce our outdoor water use and, and really um, just use water for our, the essential things that we need. Uh, communities can also switch their water sources. So as I mentioned, Joliet is thinking about switching to Lake Michigan. And then on a larger scale, we can really think carefully about where we should locate new population jobs um, and really try to focus those in on areas where we know they will have a reliable water supply in the future. So let's talk about the, next, the third and final topic. Um, we've come to the last, the last one here. And I want to step through how planning decisions influence the, the cost of providing water um, because of those larger decisions that planners make about the location and the form of development. Next slide. So first, I thought I'd just start off by stating that I think access to clean, safe water is a human right, um, meaning that as a society, we should ensure that everyone has a safe uh, source of drinking water. Um, it's also important to recognize that providing that water takes money, right? Municipalities and some private water utilities, they're required to run their water service as an enterprise fund, which means that the water rates that they collect from, from us customers are supposed to pay the cost of providing and maintaining that system. I think it's also important to think about whether we've organized our water systems in ways that might hinder our ability to ensure that everyone has access to water. Uh, so these are really important areas for, for us to think about and planners can play a role in the solution. So really quick, this slide is just reviewing some of the costs of getting water to your home or, or a business. 
So we need the treatment plants. We need the pumps, the water mains, the pipes to, to our homes. We need a water tower, all those types of things. It also takes staff to make a water system run, right? We clearly need to pay these people and ideally pay them well for this very essential service. It also takes materials like treatment chemicals to clean our water, and, and these are regular expenses that a water department has to pay for. And similarly, it takes energy to pump and distribute water. In fact, the more water we use, the more energy we use, and so that makes water conservation an important climate mitigation strategy. Um, in the next slide, we see that all of these costs are, are generally increasing. Um, a lot of our infrastructure, especially in the older sections of the region, were built decades earlier, um, and, they, and, they're, and the infrastructure is starting to get old. So pipes leak, pumps break down, water towers rust. All of these items require regular maintenance, and if it gets to a certain point, it just needs to be replaced. In fact, a, a lot of people are referring to our time period as the replacement era of our water infrastructure. Um, and there are a lot of costs associated with replacing everything that we've built already. The next one, source water contamination, links back to that first topic area I was talking about. Um, as we have more pollution in our waterways, that places more burden on our water departments to clean water. Um, it could mean that they need to invest in different treatment processes or they have to have more chemicals. Um, and all of that can increase costs. And then the final example relates back to that previous topic. So communities that are seeing increases in water demand um, or have exceeded the supply of their water might mean that they need to build new infrastructure. They e either need to build it to accommodate that increase in demand or they need to build it to switch to a different water source. And so that also adds on costs. Um, so again, how can planning play a role in any of this? Um, hopefully the first two bullets in here sound familiar. Um, as planning decisions impact water quality, uh, we can in turn have impacts on the corresponding treatment costs. So decisions that planners make to protect natural areas and improve stormwater management could result in avoided costs uh, further down the line as the overall source of water um, is, is cleaner or at least not worse. <clears throat> Similarly, as planners work to make it easy for people to use less water, that means that a local water department might not need to expand their infrastructure. Uh, so again, that's another way to avoid cost increases. But this last point is something that we haven't talked about yet, how planning can influence the amount of infrastructure per customer. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time on, on this idea. So this is an aerial photo of a village. I have to admit, I have no idea what village it is. I grabbed it off of Google. <laughs> um, it, it could be one in our, in our region. It could also sort of represent a lar the larger Chicago region in and of itself. So in the middle of the photo, we've got the main part of town. We've got a couple of neighborhoods, probably a commercial or downtown area somewhere in there. And in the foreground, we've got a couple of vacant lots. I've sort of highlighted them in that blue box. Um, these lots are dispersed in the neighborhood. And so if we added a few homes in this location, uh, then those new residents could connect up to that existing water main that probably already runs in the street. So we wouldn't have to build any new infrastructure to serve them beyond the pipe between the water main and their house. Uh, so that would mean that the town would have the same amount of infrastructure, but it has more customers available to pay for that water service. So that ratio between infrastructure and, and the customer has slightly improved with that infill development. But let's say someone wants to build out on the edge of town, and I picked a spot highlighted in red out there. So I'm gonna assume, oh, still on the same uh, slide, Katie, thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna assume that the, this area is not currently served by drinking water. Um, so new infrastructure would need to be built for the residents in this location to have drinking water. Now maybe that town gets them to pay for that expansion when they're, when they're building that lot, or maybe they don't, but either way, the town probably assumes ownership of that pipe. And, and because they are owning it, they then later have to maintain it. So that would mean that the town has more infrastructure at the end of the day. And while they've added a few new customers, that ratio of infrastructure per customer has probably gone up. And so this is an example of how the location of development in relation to existing water service really matters when we are thinking about costs. 
infill and redevelopment have a, a lot of benefits, and this is just one of them. Uh, and then the next slide, <clears throat> we, we also see that that relationship holds true even within a neighborhood block. Uh, larger lots, like the ones depicted on the diagram on the left, uh, typically means that you have fewer people contributing to the pay payment of the water main in the street. So that's not how things are organized, but it's sort of a simplistic way to view things. Um, and in this extreme example, there are just two houses that help to help pay for the water main in that street. Maybe there are another two across the, on the other side of the street. Um, but on the diagram on the right, which is what it's developed way more compactly, there are eight different houses. And in this example, we've got some townhomes, and they're all helping to pay for that same length of, of water main. So the form of our homes and our businesses play a role in how much we will have to pay for, to maintain service. In the next slide, <clears throat> we, we can see that this isn't just about new development. The same relationship is happening in areas that have seen population loss and disinvestment. So in this aerial photograph, we see a neighborhood that used to have a lot more homes uh, spread throughout the blocks. But now we can see that those are vacant. Um, there's a lot of green grass there. Um, so overall, all of these areas, still need, they still have water infrastructure to maintain, right? They still have water mains running down the center of the street um, that connect to the, the remaining homes. And the homes left on the block now have to contribute to maintain the full system that they used to share those costs with with their neighbors, but those neighbors aren't there anymore because of the vacancy. And so this is really important to think about when, when we've got uh, neighborhoods like this example. Um, typically the, the households in, in um, this location may be of, of lower income, and so they can't afford the costs that they used to share with their neighbors. I wanna spend a little bit more time on this in the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, CMAP reviewed where new development on agricultural and natural lands occurred from 2001 to 2015. And we discovered that we collectively developed nearly 140,000 acres of agricultural and natural lands, and these are shown in red. That's roughly the equivalent size of the city of Chicago. <clears throat> sort of hard to see because the red is all sprinkled throughout, um, but the, but the um, area matches up. And when we added these acres, we didn't necessarily add the population of Chicago to the region. Um, so this represents a 12% addition to the, the region's overall development footprint, but we only added 4.6% uh, to our population. And, many, and while, when we did this, we had a lot of opportunities for infill development that remained untapped. So this is a pretty significant expansion of water infrastructure without a, a comparable increase in the customers to pay for it. So as a region, our overall infrastructure per customer ratio um, has, has increased because of this, and so the costs um, are, are, will likely increase as well. Um, and so then I, I just wanted to review that we can't expect costs um, um, to be the same from, from community to community. The costs of providing water service really vary um, and that's because there are different costs associated with the different water sources and the quality of that source. And some communities have older systems that are in need of replacement. And we know that planning decisions impact the, the number of customers that are supporting any one system, and that varies from town to town. So we should expect the cost to vary, but that doesn't mean that the residents can afford their water bills. And you guys will talk more about that um, with the next speaker. Um, I did want to do a, um, cover a, a growing issue of lead service line replacement. Um, so in the next slide, <clears throat> uh, so let me back up. Lead has, has been used in water pipes for centuries. It's a, a stable material and it's fairly easy to work with. And as a result, we've got a lot of lead in our water system. This diagram is showing all the spots where lead could, could be located. And depending on how old your home is or in how many upgrades have occurred there over time, your home could have uh, lead pipes or lead solder. The solder is what holds the pipes together. Um, or lead could be in the actual faucets and the plumbing fixtures. But of particular concern is a lead service line. And that's the line that connects uh, the house to the water main and gets that water uh, from the system into, into your home. In Illinois, lead service lines were required to be used in the state as late as 1986. 
And given how old the development is in the region, that means we have a lot of these lead service lines to deal with. Uh, and just a note, that typically the water main in the middle of the street is not composed of lead. So lead can enter drinking water when, when any of these elements that you see here corrode or start to break down. Uh, this process is called leaching. And this is, can be particularly true if you haven't used the water in a while. So maybe you went, you were gone on a weekend trip um, and, and as a result, the water is just sitting in your pipes. Um, that water could have a higher lead content if the pipes are corroding. Um, many of you have probably heard of the Flint water crisis. Uh, like many communities in the Chicago region, they also had lead in their service lines and inside their homes. Uh, their, their issue is made worse because of a decision to change their water source. Uh, that change um, and, and the change in the chemical composition of their new water led to even more corrosion of that lead pipe. And, and so that's what released the lead um, into their water system. We've had something like that happen in the region, uh, the village of University Park. University Park needed to switch their water source because their existing one, a shallow groundwater um, well, had become too contaminated with road salts. Uh, so they instead decided to switch and tap into the Kankakee River. However, the utility um, struggled to the, with the taste of that water, and they ended up adding more chemicals that led to the corrosion of their pipes. And so uh, lead was released uh, through that process. Uh, so what can you do about this? I'd highly recommend getting your water tested if you haven't already. I got mine tested right away when I moved into my apartment. Uh, I was concerned my house was built in the 1890s, so 130 years ago. Uh, from that test, I learned that the first flush of water, um, after I haven't been using it for a while, has small amounts of lead, which means that there's probably lead pipes uh, with inside the building. Uh, I got a water filter designed to filter lead, um, which is great because I can continue to use the tap water um, avoid and avoid using bottled water, which is um, significantly more money and, um, as well as an environmental uh, problem. Uh, so in the next slide, we can see um, what the impacts are of lead. Uh, we, while we've been using lead for a, a long time, uh, we also know about the health, we've also known about the health risks for a long time. Uh, there are no safe levels of lead consumption. Uh, this diagram highlights a few of the impacts, uh, some of which can be pretty significant. Uh, children are particularly vulnerable to lead exposure, which can lead to irreversible brain damage and, and other, other issues. So we really need to get the lead out of our homes and replace our, our lead service lines that are composed of, of this um, toxic source. Uh, so what does any of this have to do with planning? Um, <clears throat> It sounds more like a straight up an infrastructure issue. And for the most part, it is, right? Um, the, the water department needs to figure out uh, where the lead service lines are and replace them. But planners can be a good partner in this issue. Um, and that's because we're involved in, in other spending and construction projects. We can help coordinate with other, with other entities like the transportation department to make sure that we're thinking strategically about replacing those lead service lines when we're working to rebuild a street. Um, also, this really relates to those larger decisions about where new development is located. Um, if we've got a lot of maintenance, right, like lead service line uh, replacement is going to be expensive, um, we need to make sure we have enough money. And so we should be thinking about whether we should expand and create more infrastructure when we really uh, need to focus on replacing the components that we have. And on a related front, a community's need to, re to replace their lines uh, might mean that, that other projects in the community uh, need to get delayed, right? So we need to be aware of, of these needs as planners and help communities prioritize those efforts to make sure that we have uh, a, a, healthy, a healthy public. Um, so with that, I thought I'd just reiterate the, the main takeaways from this presentation. Um, you know, we talked about the role planners have in maintaining the quality of our drinking water, how much water we use on a daily basis, and how much it costs to get clean water into our homes and businesses. And so I'm looking forward to hearing any questions you may have. I've seen a ton of them coming through the chat. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. That was a great presentation. You covered a lot of really, really interesting material on this topic. We do have a ton of questions. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but I 
thought I'd share um, first, um, Katya had a great question that I think connects to a lot of other topics um, of interest and concern to planners and others. Um, Katya says, uh, she asks, if concentrating urban development is a primary way to preserve water resources, should we focus on the major should we focus the majority of our planning resources on addressing reasons for urban flight, like housing affordability, crime, uh, as a way to limit the strain on the Collar County's water resources in the future? I think I think that's a great strategy. I mean, it's gonna take a number of different um, um, methods, right? And so that's definitely one, right? Um, when we see areas that, that could accommodate a uh, new population and new neighborhoods or new residents, uh, that's a great way to add those customers to our existing infrastructure so we, we pay for that system more effectively, right? Um, and then we also aren't, are not relying on Lake Michigan, which is um, arguably a, a more sustainable water source. So great point. Great. Thanks, Nora. And we'll try to respond to, to the other questions in the chat. Um, and post some of those responses to the Engagement HQ webpage because I know there's a lot of great questions in there. We wish we had time to get to them all live. Um, but at this point, I want to thank you again, Nora, and then turn it back over to Katie, who's going to transition us to the next uh, portion of our session. Thanks, Maggie, and thanks, Nora, for that great presentation. Um, thank you all for your questions as well. Uh, we're transitioning now to discussing water affordability and equity with Daniel Cooper, who is the Director of Research at the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, Dan has joined MPC in 2018 and is skilled in data and policy analysis, as well as visualization and tactical research. He is heavily involved in projects that promote water affordability across the Chicago area. So Dan will take some time to talk a bit more about this work and, and demonstrate the water affordability dashboard tool that he helped develop. Um, and then we will participate in an interactive activity where we will have small group discussions um, about your exploration of the tool, which was posted um, on our engagement site prior to the session. Um, and then we'll discuss how to address uh, water equity issues. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Dan. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about uh, some work we did at MPC in partnership with Nora and others from CMAP, as well as uh, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Um, so we had we got together some of the smartest people who were thinking about water affordability, and um, I'm going to share my screen here and uh, give me a second. Let me get my slides up. All right, so um, I think Nora did a nice job setting up this issue, uh, and we're going to talk, go a little bit more in depth about uh, why it is uh, we have a problem with water affordability and um, some thoughts about what we can do about it. Uh, so the, the problem um, is that, uh, as Nora also po pointed out, we have aging infrastructure. So one thing that's great about cities is their history, their they're but they're old a lot of this a lot of the infrastructure we all rely on was was built maybe even 100 years ago uh or more right and so by some estimates to replace all the aging infrastructure in this country over the next 10 years it, it could cost more than one trillion dollars um and we haven't been doing a good job keeping up with this right funds from the federal government and other sources have slowed and so we've kicked the can down the road on replacing infrastructure um, so, if, as you see in this chart, the cost um, of residential water has almost doubled over the last 10 years, right? So, um, the rate was uh, $4 per 500, per, per 5,000 gallons in 2008, um, almost double that in 2018, and it keeps going up. Um, and the big problem is this is going up above and beyond people's incomes. So, typically people's incomes are rising year over year but at a much slower rate than this. So there's a gap between how much people are getting paid and how much they're expected to pay for their water. Um, we know that water costs are going up around the country um, in about, I think 
uh, a survey of 30 of the largest municipalities in the country showed that water rates were growing in 50, 57 or 60 percent of them, basically. Um, that's even more so uh, in the Chicago region. Surveys have shown that more than two thirds uh, of municipalities, um, the water rates have been growing faster than incomes. Um, so let me go to the next slide. And I think uh, Nora may have showed a version of this map. Um, this illustrates part of the challenge and why a one size fits all approach um, is gonna be tough, right? Because each place gets their water from a different source, right? Some, like in the light blue, this water is, is coming from Lake Michigan. Um, others, as you get farther out west, um, maybe getting water from rivers or other groundwater sources. Um, and some farther out even have wells, right? Um, so all this leads to variable pricing. Um, the farther away from the lake you go, the more municipalities your water passes through, um, the higher the cost of supplying that water, right? Um, and the point we wanna make with this study is that no matter where you are, where you live, um, every single area has poor people, poor families um, who are gonna struggle to pay the bills, right? So if you have a variable pricing system like we have, uh, we know that that's one solution is not gonna fit for everybody, but everyone's gonna have to figure out a solution uh, because everybody basically is struggling with um, having some communities or neighborhoods where people might be having trouble paying the bill. So we came to this problem knowing that water rates are going up, incomes are not, and this is becoming more and more of a challenge. Uh, what do we want to contribute to this? How can we raise this, uh, raise awareness and get people working on this? Um, and so the first objective we had in the study was to think about a different way of defining water affordability, right? It's not, it's not something you pick up the paper typically and read about in your daily news. The biggest problem facing the Chicago region is water affordability, right? Um, not a lot of people have typically identified it as a problem. So we want to have a more nuanced view so people can understand um, water affordability as a top equity issue. Um, and then we wanted to identify where in the region um, people might be struggling the most to afford their, their basic water service. Um, and then finally, um, the, the main part, and this is what I would love to hear some brainstorming on you all are, uh, or, or this is what I'll conclude with and maybe have some feedback on, is uh, help identify solutions to ensure that everyone has access. We want, above all, for people to think of water affordability as a human right and to encourage all areas of government to figure out how to make that happen so that everybody has access to affordable water. So, um, we started with this problem of, and this is very technical and researchy, um, the industry doesn't have a good way of defining what water affordability means. There's no generally agreed upon rate uh, or measure. Um, and I think it's, it's historically dependent on who's been talking about water affordability, what their purpose is. And so that leads to all sorts of different conclusions. And so what we wanted to do with this study is say, okay, historically, the way most people have talked about it, they just look at the average person. So in your community, if you live in Chicago, the average income or the median income in Chicago is around, um, I forget what it is off the top of my head, 60,000 something. So we take that and say a person should be able to, uh, you know, afford water, they should pay about 2.5% of their income for water. So if the average person can afford spending 2.5%, that's okay. Um, so the problem with that is that you lose, uh, you leave out large sections of the population um, who are poor, right? Who aren't the average household. And so we wanted to make sure our analysis centered the most vulnerable households, um, those that have the lowest incomes. So here's an example of what I was, was talking about. So if you look at this map, what's in red uh, is our, our cities, municipalities, um, that have at least one area, one neighborhood, we define it as a census tract, um, where, whereby the average user definition, uh, only four municipalities have an area where by this metric, they would show up as being water burden. So what this means is, you know, you look all across the different neighborhoods in Cook County, um, in Chicago, for example, and you say, okay, well, if the average person, like the average income earner can, can basically afford it. So therefore water is not a pro water affordability, not a problem. 
But when you, when you center the poorest households, those that make the least amount of money, and see if, if, if they can afford spending 2.5% of their income, you get a completely different picture, right? Now you see across the region, in every county, there are municipalities that have at least one neighborhood where the poorest people will struggle to pay for their, for their water bill if we assume they, they spend 2.5% of their income. So it's a very different um, conclusion when you center the poorest income earners versus the average income earners. And historically, we've looked at maps like this on the left and said, water affordability, not a problem. But when you center poor folks, it is a problem. And so we want this to be the leading definition that everybody uses to talk about water affordability, um, because this means we're looking at water as a human right and saying everybody should be able to afford it, no matter what your income is. Another way we, th we thought about it um, and created another map, this, isn't, uh, this is a little difficult to see, but, but basically the problem of water affordability, like I outlined earlier, is a function of, of two main problems. One is that water costs are going up. We're replacing aging infrastructure. Um, so the price of water um, could be potentially high and that incomes are, are not growing fast enough. Um, so typically, you know, folks in this industry don't, they sort of ignore people's incomes because they say, well, we only have uh, to worry about the cost of water and water delivery. Um, but we, you know, we looked at this and said, well, let's identify areas where either A, um, the cost of water uh, delivery is, is going to potentially be high, too high for people, or there are a lot of poor people who are going to have difficulty um, affording the bill. So um, either or, so here are some areas, census tracts, where um, if you, the darker the color, the more um, burdened, overburdened they are with water. Um, so as you can see, again, across the whole region and every county, we have some areas where um, people for either income reasons or for water cost reasons are going to have trouble paying the bill. So when you frame it like this, this the conclusion we want people to reach is this is a problem for everyone. It's not just a, uh, a Cook County or a Chicago problem. It's in every county and in every municipality problem. Um, in addition to the report, which is, you know, if you're a researcher, you like reading reports, graphics are cool. Um, but we also wanted people, wanted a tool for people to be able to use if they didn't want to just read a report. Often reports sit on shelves. And so we developed this dashboard, uh, which I understand folks have seen and have been playing around with. Um, I'm just going to pull that up as well real quick and take a quick tour. Okay, so here is our dashboard. Um, so we wanted people to understand water costs and compared to other essential um, household costs and be able to compare across municipalities. So if you're somebody who lives in Chicago and you want to see how Chicago stacks up to other cities, um, we built this tool that you could, could play around with, right? So here you see in Chicago, you, can this, uh, you see the median monthly income right here is $4,500 roughly. Um, so here are all, oops, sorry about that. Um, and so here are all the essential monthly costs. Uh, here's the average water bill in, in 2018. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention, I should have mentioned this earlier, one of the coolest things about this study is that um, it's really hard to get data about this, but we had a really hardworking researcher who, whose name is Margaret Schneemann, who worked at CMAP, also at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. She called um, over uh, 250, 280 municipalities across the region to, to get their water costs, right? So it was her hard work just calling and calling and building this data set so we know how much each municipality charges for water. Otherwise, this wouldn't have been possible. So, you know, a lot of hard work goes into research behind the scenes and you often don't get to see these things. You just see a cool graphic like this, but um, part of the research is doing the time and the, the long slog of hard work to make sure you have good data to, to draw these conclusions, which then influences policy. So just wanted to make that note. Um, so here are some other trends. You can see this is Chicago has more renters than owners. 
Um, and then here's this problem of income growth and water growth, right? So here's how much incomes have grown over the last 10 years, 27%. Okay, great. We're making more money than we were in 2008 on average. But then look at how much water bills have been going up in Chicago, 80%, right? So incomes aren't keeping pace. Um, so that's, that's something we want to, want, want to center in this analysis. Um, we also looked at, so this problem of, you know, like Chicago, you see that, again, water bill growing faster than income. Uh, is this happening everywhere? And where has this happened the most? So we did this cool tool where you can just look and say, okay, North Riverside, um, that's the biggest gap. Water rates have gone up 184% and incomes have only gone up 37%. So we know in this municipality, North Riverside, this is likely to be a huge problem for people. Um, in Piatone, maybe not so much, right? Water costs have actually gone down. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for this, which we can get into in a second. Um, so the, the blue dots show places where um, incomes have uh, grown above and beyond the costs of water. Um, but, but like we said, about 80% in our sample, we know that water costs are growing over incomes. Um, so we thought this is a cool tool just to illustrate this point and people can scroll through it and, um, and, and see where their municipality falls. Um, one final piece of this tool, um, we thought a, a final way of looking at this is to say, okay, we know that there are, are very low income households who make something like 10,000 a year or even lower. Um, so if we assume that uh, these households have to pay two point or, or you know, they only make $10,000 a year, how many hours would they have to work to afford a water bill? And for some communities, you know, hypothetically, they would have to work their entire paycheck in order to, if they work two hours at that rate, um, in order to afford this. Um, so you can see this is kind of, it, this tool is really just to help understand, it's just a different way of, of thinking about like how many hours would the poorest people have to work if they had to pay for their water based on their income. So one thing to note is we don't know at the household level exactly who's paying the water bill. Some folks are renters whose landlord pays the bill, um, others are owners. Um, so since we don't have data from every single household, we just have to make some guesses based on what the water rates are and what we know people's incomes are. And so that's how you get up, we, we have a sort of tool like this to say, in some places, like in the south suburbs, there are there are very low incomes. And those for those folks, we know it's gonna be very hard to pay for water bill. Um, so a cool story about this, I'll just share real quick before I conclude and we can have some discussion. Um, the city of Evanston um, has been very interested in this issue and has been working with um, my organization, MPC, um, and CMAP and others to really use the data and, and say, hey, you guys, please help us understand what's behind increasing water rates, what, what can we do to keep this affordable. Um, even though Evanston is a place that incomes have gone up and water bills um, haven't grown as fast. Um, but this really resonated with folks in Evanston and they said, we want to center ability to pay for water. We think that's important. So like, what can we do? Are there things we can do to make um, water more affordable to low income uh, people? And so, uh, right now, there's, there's some pilot programs and changing the billing structure or figuring out different ways to structure the cost to make it more affordable for poor people. Um, if anyone wants to throw up in the chat really quick, um, a municipality or an area, I will uh, pull it up and we can take a look real quick. Oops, does anyone want to shout it out? I apparently closed down my Zoom and I can't see. <laughs> All right, we've heard uh, St. Charles is the Saint first <laughs> in the chat Rock box. River yeah. Valley. All right. Okay, so here's St. Charles. Um, so we see water rates have gone up by about 70%. Incomes have gone up about 32%. So 
water bills are growing uh, above and beyond income. So we know this is a problem of affordability here. Um, here are some demographics. Uh, and you, you notice that incomes here are much higher, the median income. But even St. Charles probably has at least one neighborhood where there are poor folks um, who are struggling to pay for the bills. Um, and this is, you can see, compared to the average across the region, St. Charles is um, a, a higher income community, right? But still something to be aware of, right? Um, so, uh, this tool is, is available for anyone, any municipality to use, or any person, advocate, household member. Um, and, and we've heard that this has been really useful for folks. We've had a number of different municipalities us and say, can you help us understand this? Um, and so um, us and other organizations uh, are working to try to make sure uh, every municipality is doing everything they can to make water affordable. But, um, and I'll end on this piece, um, it doesn't, we don't want the burden only to be on municipalities. Um, we hope there are more creative solutions where we can kind of think regionally about this problem. You know, what, what can the state government do to help um, defray some of the costs of this for, for, in, for poor folks? And how can we share the costs across the region so that we don't have such huge disparities in both ability to pay and the cost of water? So these are things we're working on currently um, to, try to, to try to solve. Um, and so the concluding que question is, uh, you know, after you've heard this information from your other speakers and from me, um, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that people have uh, access to affordable, everyone has access to affordable water? Um, do we need to get this information out? Do we need people to think differently about it? I want to know what's compelling to you all as you've heard this, like what gets you excited? What do you think will change people's hearts and minds? And with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think that's a great segue to us um, moving into our breakout group discussions. So at this point, we're going to assign all of our FLIP students to a breakout room for some small group chat. Uh, about our conversation so far today. Um, each of the rooms is going to have a facilitator, either a CMAP staff person or Dan. Um, and really, this is going to be about 10 minutes um, to talk about our students, get, get our students' thoughts on what they've found interesting about this discussion so far. Thank you all for the great conversations. I hope you had uh, great discussions in your breakout rooms. Uh, we just wanted to leave uh, just a few moments for a wrap up. Um, so I think we would turn over to Dan for some just very uh, final words about water equity and then uh, hand it over to Michelle and Courtney to wrap up the session. Looks like we... Uh may have lost Dan. Uh, Dan, can you hear us all right? I can, but I have to jump on another call, so I wanted to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I will briefly share uh, what we talked about in my session. Um, I had the pleasure of, of meeting a few students, and we talked about the rising cost in water and how that doesn't match up with the, the, the rising cost in income or the, the increase in income. So in seeing that disparity and realizing that people are paying so much more for their water, but their income isn't increasing is, is quite troubling. And so that was a really interesting conversation we had. And if you uh, care to share what you talked about in your group, feel free to add it to the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you all, but we are um, about <laughs> at time. And so um, I will briefly close us out um, and then hand it over to Courtney, who will um, provide us with our, our final prize winner for today. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. Special thank you to our session leaders, Katie and Maggie, who are fantastic in leading us this week. Also, a special thank you to our guest speakers, Nora Beck and Dan Cooper. Um, and I just want to uh, briefly mention that um, next week is our third session planning admit COVID-19. So please be sure to tune in. And that's next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. 
Also, be sure to head over to the FLIP engagement site to review the pre-session content for next week. Uh, this week, we had over 250 responses on the forum tab for session two, which is amazing. So 